Hi everybody, Levi Clay here, back again to do another Inside Story video. You know, when you've got pals that have cool things going on, it's nice to kind of bully them into coming and talking to you and maybe getting a little bit more information than you might be able to hear from them when they're talking to other press outlets. So um, yes, if Tom looks very awkward and uncomfortable in this interview, you'll know why. So that kind of spoils who we're talking to today. Um, I guess the title also does that as well. I am having a conversation with Mr. Tom Quayle, the man, the legend, the hero, the man that has his own signature Ibanez guitar. Making waves on the scene. Tom, say hello. Hello, everybody. And I kind of, you didn't bully me into this, but it's the second time I'm late, so I have to apologise. <laughs> the first time I completely missed it due to circumstances beyond my control, but this time, 15 minutes late, so sorry, dude. This is uh, just uh, the nature of being successful now, because I did one with Martin, and he was also about 40 minutes late. So. Oh, really? You know, okay, I don't feel back, so bad Back in then. the day, you know, you were all, all pals and, like, pros, always on time, whereas now, you know, yeah, I'm just no, a little no, fish. No respect at all. My apologies. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, why don't you hold that guitar up for us again, and we'll. Uh, yeah, it's a beaut, isn't it? The lighting's terrible in here, actually, but um, I have a huge strip light overhead, so that's why it looks like I've got the shiniest forehead in the world. But um, it it really is a beauty. Um, it's not. Well, we'll talk about this later, but it's a big departure visually from what I normally go for. So yeah. we'll talk about that though. Cool. Um, yeah, what you need is nice lighting in your studio like this. It's... You you are looking seriously posh these days. How do I look like the professional? Actually, I mean, you can't even see the camera that's actually filming me right now. But yeah, ha. Uh, yeah. So why don't we take a talk a talk a little bit about you and your history with Ibanez? Because when I f I think yeah, when I first um, discovered your playing and your music online, you were playing an Ibanez S series, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was, absolutely. So um, much like I said, and much like Martin said, <clears throat> um, it's hard to be uh, a guitar player under the age of 40 who doesn't have a strong tie to the brand of Ibanez because, you know, they're legends. So why don't you talk to us about your history with Ibanez? Well, literally, since the first day I started taking guitar seriously, I've owned an Ibanez. My first actual guitar was a Marlin Slammer in lime green, <laughs> which was a horrific thing. Uh, and we stripped it off, um, as in stripped all the paint off in nitro, what do they call it, nitromorse or whatever it was, and it still looked horrific. But I wasn't really playing back then, so my first proper guitar was an Ibanez RG470, which was a seriously cool guitar. Um, <laughs> I think that guitar might have been made in Japan as well. I can't remember back then if they were making guitars in Indonesia or uh, Korea or wherever. Anyway. Um, that was an amazing guitar. And then I had an RG760, which was like a custom thing with a blue flame top. It was probably a veneer, maybe it was a top, and gold hardware. And I actually went to jazz college with that guitar. So you can imagine the looks I got when I turned up <laughs> to kind of play some 251s with that kind of uh, shred beast guitar. But I was playing Dream Theater, Steve Vai. It's probably very similar to you. So all of my influences at that time, when I was between the ages of 15 and 18, all played, well, the vast majority of them played Ibanez. Yeah. So they were all the heroes. We used to look at the guitar magazines, all the Ibanez catalogs, that kind of thing. Um, and then when I did the jazz thing, I actually had a Gibson 175 for quite a while, but I never gelled with it. So as well as that, I had, a, I had an AS80 from the 80s, which was an amazing guitar, an AS1, how now, is it 5.3? Which was like the, the, the flame maple topped guitar with the, uh, the fine tuners on the bridge, yep. which was... Uh, David Beebe's still got one. It's a ridiculous guitar that didn't cost a lot of money. Um, and then the guitar that people first saw me playing on YouTube was that uh, S2075FW. I liked it so much I can still remember the really bizarre... They, Ibanez, everybody knows, have really bizarre Well, you're, uh, you're, you're in there guitars. now, so maybe you could have a word with someone and get them to you know, fix that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's fine for me because this the name of this TQM1 makes perfect sense. Yeah. But S2075FW makes no sense to anybody. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, th that guitar was amazing. Um, you know, I've always owned Ibanez guitars and I plan to always own Ibanez guitars for the rest of my life. I mean, I've got a seven string kicking around somewhere as well, which is pretty crap, to be honest. But, um, <laughs> that's my fault because I paid 299 quid for it. And so. because it has seven strings on it. Yeah, and I'm not a seven I'll string player. I'll just move my head out of the way where you can see my green seven string. So yeah, I'm allowed to make jokes about seven strings. I own one. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So Ibanez, long history of Ibanez. You've obviously uh, you played Sir for a fair amount of time. Yeah, um, that's probably three, two, three years, something like that. I think. And then moved over to uh, Fibonacci for quite a while. 
Yep, five years with Fibonari. But I guess the interesting thing, um, and this is really the inside story type of thing, you were you were the huge surprise. I was chatting with Martin about, uh, you know, when he told me he got a signature model, he said, oh, there's some other, other cool signature artists coming. Um, you know, take a few guesses to see if you can guess who they are. Um, I won't tell you if you get it wrong or right, but yeah, and I threw a couple of names out, and yours, I threw your name out, and he went, nah. No, no, think bigger. <laughs> and that, that kind of threw me off the scent a little bit. Um, but yeah, when it kind of became <laughs> confirmed that you had a signature model, it was um, a big surprise because you obviously had such a, a strong relationship with Fibonari. So I guess yeah. the interesting question is, um, how did the Ibanez thing come about? How did that happen? So it was as much of a surprise to me as it was to anybody else, obviously. There's, there wasn't sort of this people imagine that there's with these kind of things there's been talks in the background for months and this has all kind of been bubble, bubbling in the background for maybe a number of years or whatever but in this case Ibanez for the past probably two or three years at NAM because that's where I would see the guys mm -hmm. have said to me we'd love to give you a an artist deal not a signature deal an artist deal mm -hmm. if you want to join Ibanez if you want the guitars you know We'll, we'll do an artist deal and, and, and we'll figure something out. So basically the same deal Martin was on before the signature guitar. Yeah. But I was always saying to them, thank you so much, but you know, I'm happy with Fibonari. I'm, you know, I'm getting great guitars. The guys are like family. They're really, really fantastic. And then last year at NAMM, I was ushered. This, this is the bit that people know because I've said this already to people. Um, but I was ushered into a room in the Ibanez booth and it was this tiny room where all the suitcases and stuff were kept and you literally couldn't move and they handed me a guitar which is obviously the AZ prototype or AZ because I'm British um, prototype and I had to hold it like this because the room was so small I couldn't actually bring the guitar down so I couldn't really play it there was nowhere to plug it in and the first thing I did was grab the neck and I was totally blown away which is not hyperbole <laughs> I'm not I'm not saying that because this is now in my hands and I have to say it I literally, at that time, when they gave me the guitar, I thought, that does not feel like any Ibanez neck I've ever played before. It feels like every super high-end, boutique, kind of um, clinical, if you like, guitar, clinical in a good sense, as in it feels incredibly accurately made. Mm -hmm. There's no flaws anywhere. Um, and that was the impression I got. Obviously, stainless steel frets, the baked maple, the same profile that you would find on let's say, other boutique guitars that we yeah, all yeah. know and love. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and obviously that's that's a big part of what they were going for. And immediately I was just thinking, wow, this is a great guitar. I didn't at all at any point think maybe I should approach them and say I'd like to play these guitars. Still perfectly happy, totally 100% happy with Fibonari. Still think they're an incredible bunch of guys, amazing guitars. I have nothing but praise for that brand. They're incredible, as we all know. Yeah. And they've become a lot bigger on the scene, and too, you know, rightly so. They make fantastic instruments, and they're getting better and better and better. But after I'd left the booth, the Ibanez booth, didn't think anything more of it, just was very excited. I actually went to speak to Lee Wraith, because Lee at the time was obviously, he's, and is still very, very heavily involved with Ibanez, and we had a little chat about it, because that's what you do when you've, we didn't talk to anyone else about it, because it was secret at the time. Um, and I'd been sworn to secrecy, obviously, about the guitar. And then slipped over at Nam, broke my elbow, was feeling very sorry for myself, went home. Uh, actually went to New York first, did a clinic at yep. Rudy's for Fibonari with David Beebe because I couldn't play. Got home and about six weeks later, just as my elbow was healing, completely out of the blue, an email arrives from that basically the head A&R guy from Ibanez in the USA, actually, not Hishino in Japan, yep. although obviously he works for Hishino. Um, I won't mention his name because people will look him up and send him all sorts of emails going, can I have a guitar deal? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, but, yeah, well, people just go to NAMM for that, don't they? Well, I suppose, I suppose. <laughs> um, so he get, dropped me an email saying, listen, we're coming over to the UK. We, we want to come to your hometown. Um, we've got a gift for you of a prototype Ibanez. And they said, there's no uh, kind of requirements with this. We just want to give you the guitar. And that was the blue flame top guitar, the prototype that I now own. Yep. Really amazing guitar. Um, and then at the end of this email was this thing, I think it was at the end. Uh, it's kind of a blur because when I read the email, I was just so astounded. It said, also, we'd like to talk to you about the possibility of you having a signature guitar. And the thing is, when 
a company, say, you know, almost any other company could have offered me that deal. In fact, I would go as far as saying any other company, including the huge brands, Fender, PRS, whoever, could have offered me that deal and I would have said no because I was so happy with Fibonari. But it's Ibanez. And everything we've said up to this point, my entire musical, let's not even call it career, my entire musical life up to this point, and guitar is my entire life. I can't remember what I was doing when, before I was 15. Uh, my life basically in my brain started at 15 when I started playing guitar. Yep. I don't know if you feel the same, but yeah, I, know I, know Martin, <laughs> I know Martin does as well. Um, was Ibanez all the way with some bits here and there of other guitars. So like I say, a, a 175. Um, I had an Ibanez lawsuit guitar for a while, a 70s kind of uh, jazz guitar. But, you know, I had some Fibonaris and some Sirs and they were and still are incredible guitars. But Ibanez offered me a signature deal. Yep. You just don't say no to that yeah no no for ver for various reasons first of all because that's your dream and very rarely in life do those kind of dreams if ever come true so you have to say yes to those things when they come up and secondly music is a business yeah and there are elements to it people may not like that it may leave a sour taste in their mouth but it's best to be honest about these things there are very good reasons to sign a signature deal with a big company like Ibanez. It sweetens everything if that happens to be one of your dreams that you've had since you were the age <laughs> yeah. of 15 somewhat as well. But the reality of the situation is that, that when a big brand like that, who you've wanted to have a, you know, dreamt about having a signature guitar deal with for a long time, offers you a deal, you don't say no. Yeah. So that's the reason why. Absolutely want to make it 100% clear, I still have all the respect in the world for the Fibonari guys. They are incredible builders they build unbelievable guitars the most humble and wonderful people i've ever met in my entire life and i i have to thank them for everything over the last five years i'm glad that they're more present on the guitar world sure. map now and i wish them nothing but the best for the future and and they as a company can still offer something that ibanez don't offer which is you want something unique something special and you've got money to spend, then go for a company like that. I'm, I've just placed a custom shop order with a brand that will be all revealed in, in future. Um, I know what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I did that was because I wanted something just unique, special, one, completely exactly. one of a kind. Um, whereas if you want um, you know, a, a prestigious model, oops, microphone, if you want a model, um, then you know, a company like Ibanez, you're going to get something um, fantastic so um, let's just uh, I'll pull my face up on screen why don't we talk just briefly then about this idea of why you you obviously know this but but too many people kind of miss this aspect you know music business half of it is music half of it is business why on earth do, does Ibanez want to come want to work with someone like you it's obvious to me you pull in the best part of a million views a month online People watch you, and more importantly, you know, we watch you, you're an excellent player, and we go, we're staring at the guitar. It's not like, um, I don't know, Mike Stern or whoever, you know, how I, Mike, I pick Mike because actually he's one of my favorite players of all time. But how influential is, is someone like Mike in 2017, or 2018 now? Wow, look at that. Um, in 2018, uh, at selling a, a, a guitar. So, yeah, what, what can you say about the change in the way um, companies in particular are dealing with? Um, the, the business side of things. This is really interesting to me because I think players like Martin and I get quite a lot of, I don't know if stick is the right word, but fundamentally the music business, well, let's not say music business, let's keep it more, more kind of precise. The guitar business as a sales model mm -hmm. um, has changed. Not fundamentally because the traditional model still works to great extent, which is why players like John Mayer, uh, even even players who who are no longer with us, like Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, let's let's mention someone who caused me, uh, you know I caused contro controversy with Sean Lane will still sell VGA guitars. Yeah, you know these, these guys, the traditional model still works, and I I get a lot of shtick, um, not a lot actually, way less than I expected. In fact, hugely way less than I expected. <laughs> I, I thought this would be a huge sticking point. People saying Tom's not even released an album yet. He doesn't tour. He doesn't do this. You know, doesn't do that. Um, but that's not how the model works, or it's one of the ways that the model doesn't work anymore. Um, the online scene is enormous now, yeah. and companies are taking huge notice of this. Now, the one thing I do object to is when people say, ah, oh, these YouTube guys, the YouTube stars getting signature guitars. Martin and I are not YouTube stars. Yeah. 
I, I have 50,000 subscribers. Martin has 46 or something, 47. Yeah. That is, that is small That's fry. Tiny. Yep. tiny for YouTube. And in fact, I haven't uploaded videos to YouTube apart from some demos and some Guitar Hour stuff probably for about two years now. Yep. So it's not just the YouTube thing, you know, it's, it's more than that. It's the online presence in general. You know, I, I did release an album last year. I do play all over the world. So does Martin. Martin has an actual bona fide album out as well. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we do play all over the place. In fact, we put ourselves in the lion's den and the majority of stuff that we do is play in front of guitar players who are baying for us to, <laughs> to I don't know, like... Do, do the thing, do the legato thing, yeah, yeah. Do, the, do, the, do the picking thing, you know, so we put ourselves in the lion's den, really. You know, last year, I was saying to my partner, I spent 11 weeks out of the 52 in the, in the year outside the UK playing in various parts of the world. Yep. Now, that combined with the online world, Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, the Guitar Hour, Lick Library, Lesson Sales, so on and so forth, it would evidently seem... it. it is it, it's it blows me away, but it would evidently seem that companies are interested in these things now. Yeah. Just look at a company like Jamtrack Central. You know they are producing not they're not producing, but they are enabling the guitar stars of the future. You know they're the equivalent of Mike Varney back in the day, yeah. Mike, Mike and Mark Varney. Um, you know Jan Serkin maybe doesn't see it that way. I hope he sees it that way, but he is <laughs> in, enabling. Uh, as well as Instagram and YouTube and Facebook, but I think Jamtrack Central in particular and Lick Library, of course, yep. are enabling the guitar stars of the future to become very visible on the scene. And companies are interested in this. Yep. Big, big companies are working with Jamtrack Central. They work with Lick Library. They work with individuals, including myself. Um, you know, it's like with Wampler. Wampler, in fact, you know, in terms of releasing the Dual Fusion, that's a really successful pedal. Now that's partly down to me and my online presence, and that's partly down to the well, that's hugely down to the fact that Brian makes seriously yeah, yeah, kick yeah. kick-ass products. Um, I should pull up a picture they, of my pedal board, which has like nine Wampler pedals on it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you're a big Wampler guy, which is great. Um, the you know the online thing sells stuff these days, yeah. and I kind of get. I'm going to say it now, and you know you can leave this bit in if you want, but I get sick of people moaning about the fact that. You know, oh, this guy's got a signature deal and he hasn't even, you know, he doesn't even play live. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, you know, if I gigged for a living and gigged all the time, you know, I know of a guitar player, I'm not going to mention his name, um, but he's, he's touring very soon. And the struggle to get people to buy tickets. And he is an unbelievable guitar player, a very well-known guitar player, not an unknown name. And you know the struggle to get people to come out and pay for tickets. They will probably lose money. The promoter will probably lose yep. money. I can be online, and I can make. I mean, you know about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can. I can make a very healthy living and promote myself very well, and do the gigs I want to do. Do the stuff I want to do in terms of clinics and shows. Like I say, last year, eleven weeks outside the country, out of fifty-two, performing all over the world, and you know that's down to the online scene. So. Companies are taking yeah. notice, and I—I I don't want to sound preachy about this, but it does kind of—it's it's common, common sense, you know. I, I often it, yeah. draw parallels to other industries, so these people that whinge and complain get it. If you look at something like the video game industry, which I know both you and I are really into, like there's a huge change in that. 10, 15 years ago, you make a game, you desperately do everything in your power to get IGN to cover it, or Kotaku, or, or whoever. Whereas now, success is getting your game in the hands of PewDiePie. Yeah. Because he's a huge influencer, much more so than the traditional press outlets. So yeah, you're um a, you are a huge influencer. Put those guitars in your hand and they are going to people are going to take notice of them, which is um yeah. How can people bitch at you for that? Like if anything, bitch at Ibanez. Naughty naughty but, Ibanez. But, naughty Ibanez but, wanting to make a successful business. But if you but if you look at the the approach that Ibanez have taken with this, you know, they've got the guitars in the hands of Polyphia, for instance, who are playing live all over the place, and they're supported by a big, big promotional um, backing now. Yeah. And so, you know, they've 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 done the whole gamut of the whole whole business side of things. So they're doing that, but they're also this is a really progressive, very cool thing that Ibanez are doing. They're taking note of both sides of the industry. And, you know, this is not said from my... People can say whatever they like about me. And I've been doing this for long enough now, maybe maybe coming up to 10, maybe 11 years, um, that I don't worry about what people say on me on forums or on the internet. But, um, 
you know, if people want to moan about this stuff, what they should really look at is the, the, the whole range of, of business that Ibanez are doing here in terms of getting the guitar in hands of people who are, are playing in front of thousands of people every night and they're taking notice of the other side of the industry now, which is really, I would say, bigger because the number of views that people are getting, uh, I'm not talking about me now, but if you look at Instagram, some of the guys on Instagram, the number of views that these guys get and some of the bigger YouTube channels as well who have got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Oh, and they can just come out of nowhere. Like I'm, I'm pals with... Uh with Kieran, KMAC2021, 20, um, whose channel just exploded, went from 16 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers in a matter of two months. Like yeah, that, yeah. I, I, every time I talk to Kieran, I'm doing everything in my power to try and do something with him because I want to be seen next to someone like that because it's, it's good for me. Like it's, call it selfish, but business is, you know, business is business. You've got to be sensible with these things. <laughs> Um, well, this is it. So, you know, if I do a clinic in, say, if I take one example from last year, I do a clinic in the Philippines. There's probably 200 people there. You know, that's that's great. 200 people have seen, let's say it was an Ibanez clinic, 200 people have seen that guitar. But let's say I have a melodic minor video that's had over, I think it's coming up to 600,000 views now. Hmm. That's 600,000 people who've seen a guitar. Yes. <laughs> There's a very different, these are very different numbers. Yeah. And what, what kind of I'm bored of now is this idea of the legitimacy of an artist because they play in front of people in a, in a, in, in a real life situation as opposed to online. Now, I have made great pains to make sure that a lot of my online stuff is live, yep. which is why we do the Guitar Hour. Um, and combining that with the fact that I am playing live a great deal you know 11 weeks out of the year is not a touring schedule but still it's it, when you have a child two kids you know and a, and a and a partner at home it's not insignificant so i think it's a side of things that people miss and um as i say you can probably tell now i'm getting a little bit bored of that argument <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, and you know what would you prefer going back to the old days 20 years ago where your way of being successful was desperately begging a record label for an advance on something that you might or might not pay back. You know, I've, yes. I hear stories of bands that that st still like they've got charted albums there and they're out playing shows and they're sleeping on friends' floors. Meanwhile, record executives are flying people over from LA for the show, um, and that all just gets added to the band's tab. Like it's just a, uh, it's 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 crazy that people would would begrudge the modern business people you know really uh, this is like super off topic but just just come around to the idea companies like jam track central they are putting opportunities in your hands people can now go out and make a living like a genuine living in a way that you couldn't do 20 years ago there, there has never been a time this is i mean we're kind of getting off topic yeah, here yeah. but it's cool i like i like talking about this stuff so we'll come back on topic but you know there's never i, I always say this I, I do a or have done in the past do lectures at leeds college of music about um you know working in the music business and, and, and making money um, is in, the, in the modern sense, you know, you don't have to follow the traditional music plan. There has never been a better time for musicians to be more autonomous and make a better living mm. uh, as individuals, not working for a record company, so not working for a third party where you're not autonomous, you're not in control of what you're earning and not in control of, of the, you know, where your earnings are going. You know, as you know, Patreon, your uh, YouTube channel generally, your ability to sell products, in your case, your ability to sell transcriptions, which comes with its own headaches as well. Um, you know, all of this stuff that you can do is, you know, Skype lessons, the works, is all so fantastic in, in, in the sense that you as a musician now can make a very legitimate living without yeah. having, you know, a boss oh, it's, you it's know, absolutely, your head. absolutely crazy how, just how much money is out there to be made but then i think about it and it's not crazy because i spend loads of money on this industry as well you know i love it and i want to just pump money into it and i can't help it i see cameron allen has a new product and i know that i could send cameron an email and be like cameron would you send me that but i don't you know, just money give him the money i picked up aaron marshall's uh, jam play thing just recently because you know interested to check it out so you know uh, to even even i was gonna say the top guys even guys that you know are professionals in the industry they still spend money i know that you have had uh, sales of your products on your website from you know the top the the biggest of the big names because yeah, yeah uh, it's it goes hand in hand with being a guitar player just sort of being nerdy about these things and passionate yeah uh, but why don't why don't I try and pull things back on topic a little bit then? <laughs> <laughs> Though people probably will have enjoyed that more than anything else that we have to say. So um, yeah, why don't we talk about your Ibanez? Uh, because 
again, the interesting aspect of the inside story is hearing how much influence you had on your signature model, things that you requested, and how the entire process actually happens. Because I know that there are not horror stories, but in the past we hear like, you know, John Petrucci switching over to Music Man. And I've read stories that he said, well, that's because essentially Ibanez said that I could have an RG with a, with a graphic on, but I wanted something else, and that wasn't really an option. So, um, yeah, how, how picky could you be about your guitar? So this is quite an interesting one generally for me because the whole concept of this is that the AZ guitar is really, they called it at the time a player's player's guitar. So I think what they meant by, it's kind of a Jap, kind of almost, it almost sounds like kind of a weird Japanese translation, but I know what they mean. Yeah. So it's a guitar that's designed for people who are the kind of modern technical players who play lots of different genres or require lots of different sounds. So it requires the versatility, but it's got that very clinical, precise feel to it. And when I played the, the, the first prototype that they gave me in the little small room, I've got to be honest, people always say, oh yeah, of course he says this, you know, it, he's got to say this. But again, it's, it's the real deal. There's, there's nothing on this guitar apart from the aesthetics of it, because that's very personal, that I would really change. So let me go through why that's the case. The neck profile is, for various reasons, exactly the same as I would go for, because it's very similar to guitars I used to play in the past. Okay, that's as far as I'll go with that. It's got, it's got a 12 inch radius, which is really, really useful because it's not too flat. People always think you want super flat for legato, but actually that's not the case, because yeah. if it's too flat, it makes it very awkward to to be very comfortable chordally and i don't you know I, I play a lot of jazz and martin and i do a lot of duo stuff yeah. i don't spend my entire life playing legato lines on the fretboard so you know the 12 inch radius is really nice you could go for a compound radius as well but actually it doesn't actually make that much difference i find yeah. 12 inches is really nice it's flat enough but not too flat um the neck profile is really really nice it's a c-shape it's slightly flat on the back um like the old um well, I probably shouldn't say it because someone will someone will beat me up from uh, from the other company. But it's very similar to the you know the, the kind of guitars that we. Someone will say it in the comments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> locking tuners, which yep. are exactly the same locking tuners that are on all of my Fibonacci guitars, exactly the same brand, exactly the same. In fact, they were Clusons, but these are these are Gotos, um, and I believe the Clusons were actually made by Goto anyway, and they're the same locking tuners exactly. Um, You've got a bone nut, which is fantastic for um, lubrication and for um, sustain. Um, body shape's perfect. You've got, you know, it's, it's again, a super strat, which is what I'm into. The cutaway is perfect already. Um, Five-way switch with humbucker single single. And you've got this, you know, the, the alter switch, which gives you nine sounds. And the bit that really sold it to me for configuration purposes when they came to the house um, with the guitar was in the... Uh, the neck position, you actually stack these two as a humbucker, and the tone. Let me let me just switch yeah, to a clean tone. I was going to say you're plugged in. Why don't you just show us? The thing that really blew me away was if you're in the uh, the neck position and you're on the standard single coil. I don't know how well you can hear that. I hope you can hear that. Okay. Then you switch up suddenly. Yeah, it's very different. You've got a really, really authentic jazz tone. Not authentic, it is a jazz tone. It's yeah. like this super fat, and I've done nothing to the tone control. This is on 10 still. So the only thing that's changed is, oops, roll the volume up. It's, it's just this switch. So what did you say that is? That's... What, what is that doing? The what basically it, it wires the two single coils as a humbucker. Now it's obviously a little unusual because normally your pole pieces would never be this far sure. apart. But as you can hear, it's incredibly successful. Mm. It works really well. Actually, what's cool about it is you get the clarity of the middle single coil wired in. It's got to be in series with the um, with the neck single coil, so you get clarity plus that ridiculous warmth. Mm. So that. I mean, you, like, I don't think you're not coming to NAM this year, are you? But no. you know, we we could sit there and we could say to uh, the A and R guy, he'll remain nameless. The look on my face when I did when I tried that was just an absolute picture. Um, so there, there is the the reason for this. I mean, if I just go through a few other things, Goto 
custom made, but essentially this is like a 510, but it's a, an enhanced 510. So titanium saddles, the longer bar, because the, the bars on the old Sirs I used to play were down to about here. So they were a little bit awkward to grab. Yep. So it's got everything I would look for in a super strat, including, and I know people, a lot of people are like, oh my God, it's only got 22 frets. That's my bag. I have 22 yeah. fret guitars. The, old, the erotics I used to play had 24 on, but that wasn't really my choice. They just didn't make a, an erotic with 22 frets on. So they've all got 24 frets. I'm a 22 fret guy. I always have been. Um, my old Sirs had 22 frets on. The Fibonaris, that are the S-type guitars, have got 22 frets. Um, so there, there was nothing on here hardware-wise or looks-wise that I would change. And it's obvious to me, I'm not stupid, it's obvious to me that these are, you know, they're supposed to be figurehead guitars yep. for the AZ range. Sure. I understand this. And I have, I'm 100% okay with that because they're so good, these guitars. So they have everything already that I would look for in this kind of instrument. So really, the one thing that I absolutely was very clear on, and it was actually a suggestion by Ibanez initially, they said, why don't you look at some of these alternate hardwoods and I kind of looked at them they had some mock-ups of guitars and this was you know this style was one of the guitars I sort of looked at and I initially looked and went oh well normally I would have a flame top or some kind of all of my guitars have fairly insane tops on and I thought Do you know what this is a big transition period for me in many ways mentally and physically in terms of changing so you know to, to such a different brand yeah and I thought I need to hit the reset button here and I, I want something. Also, you know, I'm 37 now. So I thought I need something a little bit more. Grown up is not the right word because it's not right. Grow, you know, you can have a very grown up guitar with a really disgusting porno flame top. But I wanted something that was a little bit more uh, sedate and represented me more natural kind of, you know, yeah. more natural kind of look. So this um, it's actually called Monkey Pod and it's like Karina. It's a hardwood. And it's way more subtle, but, mm. but really, really beautiful. And so the, the other thing was it differentiated this guitar hugely from the other guitars in the range. Yep. No scratch plate. I did not want a scratch plate. I'm just not a big fan. None of my guitars, apart from one of the Fibonaris, has a scratch plate on it. Yep. And that's, that's a very specific reason for that guitar having a scratch plate on. So I really didn't want that, that on there. Um, and that's really all I needed to change. There wasn't... Again, very similar situation to Martin. There weren't Martin requested mahogany because that's he's really into that sound. Yep. I'm to totally 100% behind older. Yep. Um, nice big thick piece of, of uh, monkey pod on top, binding round the outside, and you know that suits me perfectly down to the ground. Um, so this wasn't the scenario I went in and said, well, unless you do me a guitar that's specifically this shape and so on and mm. so forth, that's it, no deal. That's just not the way I needed it to be yeah. at all. Leave, leave that for a couple of years, then you can yeah, start right. throwing that one. Um, yeah. re regarding your pickups, you've gone for the uh, HSS configuration. Was that Had you decided that from the get-go, or did you play around with the idea of having the HH configuration? I'm just not an HH guy. I like to have the single coil. I know you can coil tap and stuff, but yeah. this has always been my... I, I know in my head exactly how this should sound. Yeah. This is when I when I think about I'm a massive Wayne Krantz fan, mm -hmm. like an enormous <laughs> Wayne Krantz fan, yep. and that the sounds that kind of crunch sounds that that's not it's not super high gain, but it's got that kind of single coil position four compression thing going on. Mm -hmm. That for me, if I can have that and a bridge humbucker, I'm in heaven. Yeah. That's it for me. So you can kind of do that with two humbuckers, but it's not it's not my bag. It's a compromise. And I, yeah, exactly. It's a compromise. So it, it, it kind of is a compromise if you play jazz having a neck single coil, but now we've got this switch on and you can do the humbucker. It's, there's, the compromise is gone. I mean, it's a compromise if you play jazz and it's not a hollow body because <laughs> people are going to judge you. I thought you were going to stop it. It's a compromise if you can play if you play jazz, well, which there, I kind of there is there is that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, electronics wise, you know, it just fundamentally, if you look at the guitars I've played in the past. This just is, it's, it's really not that different. In fact, the thing that's different is they've improved on the switching system yep. of guitars I would always use in the past. Just, just the, the eye for detail. So things like, you know, why, why would I change this? Why, what would I change on here to improve it? They've really, really thought hard about, um, you know, the, 
the whole design of the guitar because this was a big deal for them to release a new design like this. You know, Ibanez don't do that very often yeah. in such a big way with a whole line of new guitars. They've really thought about this and they've nailed it. You know, the only criticism I've seen of these guitars is some people saying this neck joint's too big. But of course, you've got to transfer. Yes. The, the mass has to transfer from one to the other. So it's okay saying shave all of this off but you make the guitar less stable, as in there's more prone to kind of, um, you know, damage happening here. And then there's less mass to transfer the vibrations from the, the, the body into the neck and neck into the body, so on and so forth. So an upper fret access, 22 fret guitar, I can get way up there with absolutely no issue. So again, what would I change? It's a phenomenal instrument. Made in Japan as well, so, yeah, good. you know, top end workmanship. So I have a silly little question for you, actually. Um, okay. So I know when you order like um, like a signature guitar, for example, if you've got, um, I don't know, various metal guitar players' uh, signatures, like a, a Misha, um, or I should say the Mayonnaise Gentleman series, that comes with strings on it that are suited for the guitar, and it comes tuned to CGC FAD, right? Does your guitar, guitar come out of the box tuned in fourths? No, that would just annoy. <laughs> It's actually a question, a question a few people have asked, but no, that would just annoy people hugely. In fact, when I pulled the guitar out of the case for the first time, it was tuned in standard tuning. So, so they like you, uh, but not that much. Yeah, exactly. But you can excuse them that small, you know, uh, it takes two seconds to, to tune the guitar up. Yeah. So, you know, no big issue. We'll, we'll let them off on that one then. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, so I, we'll move on to the last kind of section of this then. What uh, What is the future holding for you? I know you've just uh, moved over to Dawson's. You're now Dawson's in-house um, product. What would you call yourself? A product demo specialist? Let's call me video specialist yep. because it's not... We, well, I'm going to be doing a huge amount of content for Dawson. So... Um, just got hold of a thousand, I was just saying to you before we started this, a thousand square foot studio with 700 feet uh, square feet on the top floor. So there's two floors. Uh, there's a lot coming up in terms of content for them. So this is going to be a lot of what I'm doing moving forwards. So actually, I'm going to plug the channel and I'm going to do it on your channel. So sorry about that. You can cut this bit out if you want. But go and subscribe to Dawson's Music because actually there's going to be a lot of content other than just demos going out on there, although there is going to be a huge amount of demo content on there as well. But lesson material, some vlog stuff as well. Um, so I'm going to start showing people around the new studio fairly soon. We're going to build some sets. Um, so stuff's going to take a, a much more kind of modern turn for the Dawson's YouTube channel. Lee, Lee did an incredible job, but we're going to take things forwards and uh, you know production quality is going to ramp up a lot. So that's a big thing for me. Um, obviously probably going to be doing, well not probably, definitely going to be doing some stuff with Ibanez um, fairly soon with Martin. Uh, Martin and I have, I'm sure you mentioned this on your video with him, a massive uh, video project that we did in November last year. So that's all coming out soon, some duo stuff and a load of oh, stuff with the band. I posted some clips of that at the start of Martin's and oh. people will have, will have seen some clips of it at the start of this. <laughs> Very good, excellent. Okay. Um, I really ought to finish my album as well. I was just um, going to say. Which, which is actually, there's quite a lot of it done, but yeah. um, ha having kids is not conducive to any of that. Plus, I have to release lesson products as well because, and we'll do stuff for Lick Library and for various other people because that's how I earn my living. I'm not going to earn any money from releasing an album, and I have two kids. So and also, you've to. got a signature guitar now, so why bother releasing an album? <laughs> you did, like, the, it's not, the old model is dead. You have no reason to release an album anymore. Maybe I'll just release singles from, from now on. Um, but actually, if people want to hear one of the tracks from the album, I'll be at a live version of that, so me playing live. Uh, Lick Library released a DVD last year, uh, old school DVD, although it's all available online, obviously, as well, if you yeah. sign up for the membership. Uh, and one of the tracks from the album is on there, actually, and I break it down and kind of teach people how to play it. And I transcribed it. I can confirm that it does exist. Oh, you transcribed that one, did you? Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay, I, I probably did know that, but I'd forgotten. Um, and obviously you just transcribed one of my, uh, the latest lesson, the modal lesson, so yeah. there's stuff on, there'll be more stuff coming up on my website as well. Um, so yeah, there's a fair bit coming up. You're busy, good. That's what we like yes. to hear. Um, very busy indeed. Okay, so any last comments um, to the fans, to the people that follow you after all these years, 10 years into your <clears> career <throat> as a guitar player? You've made it, man. Yeah. What do you want to say to people? Um, I don't think I've, well. <laughs> Nothing, you've got you never, one person you never, to thank and it's you. 
you never accept that you've made it. But um, yeah, thanks thanks for everybody who watches the videos. Thanks for everybody who supports me. Thanks for everybody for all the cool comments. Thanks to the trolls as well. You guys are cool. Um, I like responding to your, your comments. Um, yeah, uh, you know, guitar is in a very cool place right now, I think. And uh, there's lots of cool stuff happening, some amazing players. So let's all support each other and uh, move things forwards in the way that it's been going. It's a pretty cool time for guitar playing. Um, and this, people keep asking me uh, how much it's going to be, when it's going to be released, why it's not on the Ibanez website. By the time you see this video, it might be. Um, it's actually going to be on the Ibanez website from the first day of NAM. The guitar hasn't supposedly been officially announced yet by Ibanez. Um, I think there were some leaks that happened somewhere. So uh, I'm pretty sure you were the leak. Yeah, but I was told to do so. <laughs> so there must have been something else somewhere. Uh, so yeah, the, the guitar will be the, the price will be announced. The guitar will be uh, announced officially on the Ibanez website. Not sure when you'll be able to order it, uh, but you will be able to order it fairly soon. And uh, go out and buy them because it really is a fantastic guitar. And if you want a 22 fret guitar without a scratch plate, this is the one to go for because all the other guitars in the range have scratch plates on. So, and you can uh, get it from Dawson's. You can get it from Dawson's. See? You will, in fact, definitely be able to get it from Dawson's. Yeah, cool. Brilliant. Okay, awesome. Well, Tom, I'll bring my face up on screen for a second. Yep, I, I like what Tom said there. Haters are the most important thing to a YouTube channel. I take a lot of time and energy into responding to every single one. I was hoping that actually <laughs> the thing that was going to make my channel a success was someone was going to notice the effort that I go to to absolutely slap down every negative comment. Um, but no one's really noticed. But yeah, if you want if you want to have a giggle, check my comment section. I, I'll always make an effort to um, slap you down if you say something negative. Um, that's what life's all about. Uh, yeah, so huge thank you. Huge, huge thank you to Tom. Um, it really does mean a lot that he took time out of his day. It's difficult being successful and a dad and all of that. And uh, yeah having time to do silly things like this um but yeah i'm sure people will have enjoyed this so if you do have any comments for tom any hate drop them in that comments <laughs> section below because that's cool um i'm j actually lastly I, I guess i just have to bring this screen up and say thank you to these guys these guys patreon supporters they support me over on my patreon page you can see a list of names there there's quite a lot of names there now which is awesome so thank you so much for um helping to continue this channel going in the way that it's going lots more cool content like this coming up hopefully so yeah you can be like those awesome people and check me out on Patreon by um, clicking, in fact, I'm gonna keep my face up here. There's a button in the far right on screen now. That's my Patreon link. There is a link below that to subscribe to my channel. There is a link somewhere next to that to subscribe to Tom's channel. There is also a button that you can press to subscribe to Dawson's channel. And below my face right now, you will see two more videos, hopefully. One of mine, one of Tom's. Go check them out. I'm sure you will find some content you enjoy. So. Much love. Thanks for the support, guys. And we maybe will see you for another video again soon. Bye. Bye.